Thank you all for showing up. I know it's the early session. And so it's a big plus for me that you're all here in this room. My name is Christian Ritter. I'm um, presenting today PowerShell techniques and performance tweaks to you. It's called the full show because I did some similar sessions with little less content, just the user groups and PSL day, but now we spent together 90 minutes. And so I thought this is a reason to call it a full show. When you thought of that I entertain you like dancing and so on, no, not of all that will happen, but maybe, maybe if you cheer enough, then I will do a little dance for you. <laughs> so, but first, before we get straight to the code, we will thank, have to thank our sponsors. I have to thank our sponsors because without them, this, all of this would not be possible. So they are amazing. I know it's the last day, but you haven't checked out their booths outside on the hallway. Please, please do this because they offer so much great uh, content to all of us. So, let me introduce myself a little bit more because now you know my name, but maybe you're interested in me a little bit more. And I just started to integrate PowerShell into PowerPoint. How cool is this? Like I said, <laughs> my name is Christian Ritter. Nowadays, I'm a senior system engineer, so the, I have to update the property, I guess. But who cares? Um, I'm working for Cancom in Germany. Um, I'm my hobbies are I'm a husband, so more or less it's kind of a hobby or I do in my private time. Um, I'm a father of two beautiful children. I like to play uh, playing billiards, so tonight probably we have the chance to get a match together. Uh, I'm a hobby chef, so I'm the only home cook at home, so it has to be my hobby. Um, and I do like playing board games a lot. So. What I do with my, what I do when I open Visual Studio Code, I make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. There's not a single day without any red line on my screen. But I try to improve. I try to resolve things. I have a really good Google Proof score. But even if this doesn't help anymore, I always head out to the PowerShell Discord, head to the help channel. I really, really can only recommend this to you to do this as well. I try to make code go fast. I try to improve it a lot. I try to do various techniques, some kind of esoteric, just to see what is the fastest way of doing things, um, because time is money. <laughs> and I make code stable. I try to get more techniques into the code, also some kind of different. I reuse things in a another way than it was usually expected. You will see it soon after the next 73 slides. So I say this real, really heavy related VS Code session. So, um, and I blog about it, I spread the word. I go to user groups, I have a blog, I post it on social media, LinkedIn and Twitter. On the first slide, you saw all my handles. I hope you all take note or already follow me. If you haven't, don't worry, there will be a chance later in this session. Why are you clicking when I have this? Ah, I know why I'm clicking, because I forgot something. I forgot something really important. I'm so good at typing. I can type with one hand. I even can leave the stage. I'm so fast, the computer has to keep up with me. So, I believe in demo gods. I raise my hand for a demo god that will all run straight through. I hopefully are with me. Then we have a great time together, hopefully. A first disclaimer, if I'm the smartest person in this room, I believe immediately, because I try to learn something new. I try to evolve myself each day, so if anything comes up and I go, go straight through my code, and you say, I know another thing about it that makes it even better or faster. After I went through all of the things inside of a specific topic, yeah, let me, raise your hand. We can talk about it. If it's too long, I just take a quick note, I will figure those on my own or get in touch with you all, or the person who yelled at me. Um, and I will also put this on my slides or my code, so you are able to uh, also get this kind of quality content that we maybe figure out together. So, this is the disclaimer on this side. How my code is structured. I try to go, uh, redo the good, bad, and ugly Italian Western movie poster. I try ask the AI, Hey, make some, uh, use it with some cats. 
yeah, it's the internet and cats are mostly beautiful, so there's no bad, you know, or actually there's only a good. So, but stick with me, there will be more cats, even if I'm a dog person. So, you also, my session, that's the reason why I'm here, you probably have uh, read all of the content that we show. Is someone not familiar with any of the topics? You all know, you know this? Okay, perfect. Some raise their hand. Many of you know all the topics. Maybe I get, can give it another spin because I find some things on the internet, one or two, that are, that are worth to take note of. So hopefully for all the knowledge guys here, it won't be boring. Let's find out. I will talk about technique tweaks, how to make things easier, beautiful, and more stable, and better in a kind of way, or let's say other than usual. And we talk about performance tweaks a lot. So that's the two main topics I rely on this whole session. So now get rid of all those other slides, head to code. <laughs> so ah, I had to I had to escape from here. So okay, perfect. Let us start with splatting. You are all aware of splatting? Yeah? Good thing. Splatting is nice because when I have a long unreally command, it starts with the AD module, for example, new AD user, and the line goes on and on, and so many parameters, and I have scroll through, I'm at the end, I don't know what was the first parameter any model, first 15, because it's so long. Then I have to buy a wider screen, or I make use of splatting. That's the thing. Let me get to this code. Like I said, I prepared really, really, really long example for new AD user, and my hands are getting too hurt because it scrolls a lot. What was the first three parameters, you know? No, me neither. I've written this, so I should know this. Yeah? So let's go back ahead. What could we do instead? We could make use of backticking. Okay, the slide is called splatting, so probably you know that backticking wouldn't be the solution, but there are some examples on the internet there are some code that is currently active running at any server that use, make use of it. Don't do this ever. I'll show you in a second why. With backticking, we can align all the parameters just row by row by row, which is kind of good because then reading is probably easier. Then I even have to scroll for a long comment like this, but I'm able to catch 15, 20 at once. So, but the thing is, to declare a new session, you just have to do a back tick. And you may, as already noticed, if I do just a white space after the back tick, PS, read uh, PS script analyzer yells at me. That breaks my command. I can't use it anymore. And sometimes, <clears throat> on a white screen like this, uh, have you ever noticed a white space when there was nothing behind it? No, I didn't. So I can make use of uh, some kind of tweaking VS Code to make use of it. We have seen it already in uh, Kevin Market's session of um, code golfing because there we want to reduce white spaces a lot. So, okay, now we know all what backtaking is. We can run the command, it will execute, but we can also make use of a splat. We can take a hash table, we assign the key value pairs for the properties. Then we say, okay, my property name is my key, and I have a value, John Doe. So, easy to go. I can make so much white space in it like I want. Doesn't bother because it still works. And now, I just can assign the split to the command via an add sign and just get rid of the dollar sign. And now I'm good, I can use it, it works quite well. But I can also combine it with parameters. So do a split like this, I add it to my command, and I then say, okay, I just need to add the account password, and surprisingly, it works. Easy, easy go. And then, what I recently discovered, you can combine split, the split with another split. So I can have several. 
and I can make use of it in some kind of wrapper techniques. For example, I define a, uh, a split outside of a function, but it's in this case a wrapper function. It's not the best example, maybe, but hopefully you get the idea and you find a situation where you can make real good use of it. So I define a split, I say okay, for my get child item command, I've set filter and the depth fixed more or less inside of my code. I give my user a function with some parameters like the path, if it should be recursive, or if it should be a file. What would make sense if I define a filter to txt, to be honest. But you get hopefully the idea. And then I can assign the um, get child item uh, split that I defined above and also use, make use of the PS bound parameters, which is also a hash table. So I can combine them to make a wrapper function out of it. There was some finding I said, ah, that's pretty neat. Who, know, who, know, who knew this already? Perfect, not that many hands. I'm a lucky guy. So let's talk about PSD default parameter values. Anyone uses this? And anybody, everyone knows it? Okay, also more hands, perfect, but some not. It's good that you're here. So, another name. Um, hopefully you all know the movie uh, Office Space. If you haven't, you should watch this. It's amazingly funny, but I also replaced it with a cat. So if it could have defaults, that would be great. I don't have to care about things that I always do and I have always to say, okay, for this command I use in my whole script always this one specific parameter and I have to do it all the time and all the time and all the time. And I think that is something I try to avoid because I'm lazy. That's the reason why I use PowerShell at work. Yeah. <laughs> so let us see some code. So for example, I have a region here that says me there's an invoke rest method command. Invoke rest method commands can also have many parameters like new ID user, we saw already before. But the thing is, um, I couldn't make use of a splat. We already discovered this, so I could wrap it up and assign always the, my splat to the command and I should be good to go. And I really could do this because I do it in the next region. <laughs> Nothing new, we have already seen this, but then we could make use of PSD for parameter values. This variable, you shouldn't overwrite with something stupid. I don't think you can't. Maybe Fred could tell me this. If I could assign everything I want to this, or is it just fixed, I just have to push a hash table to it. No, okay, perfect. But you shouldn't overwrite this in any matter, because now I also, do the same thing like I would do a splat and would assign a splat. But the thing is, may have been noticed, I can say which is the command I'm using. For example, right here, invoke rest method, then a column, and then I use the parameter name and assign it to a value. Why is this good? The thing is, why, why I think this is a fantastic thing, <laughs> okay, why I think this is good, let's use that, is I don't have to care anymore. I can run my command, and all the time I run my command, when I have defined this, it will always say, the method is post. I don't have to um, add a splat to it, it's just always posting. Now I've made use of all of them, which is probably not a good idea, but for example, where it really come in handy is if you have a proxy. How many in one script, where you do many, many invoke REST methods, do you have to change the proxy? or the authentication. So, but even if I do, when I say, okay, I use my command, invoke rest method, I don't add anything to it, it would use, in this case, for the method, it would add it to this, and would use, make use of post. When I now say, instead, dash method, I can say get, for example, and it would overwrite the defaults. We can always overwrite the defaults. We don't have to stick to it, but it's a good idea if it's reoccurring a lot in my script. So I set it up once and forget about it because I don't, don't care anymore. Um, 
Yeah, this was this that's always useful. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, I skipped a point. You also can make use of wildcards in your PC default parameter values, which means uh, if I do it like this, invoke dash header author alteration and content type, and I use invoke dash wildcard, it would attend the um, header parameter to invoke rest method, but also to invoke web request, where they, say they have the um, header parameter in common. So I don't have to care any, any uh, more about this. I, this was really stunning for me as I discovered some time ago. I thought, that's pretty neat. But we have to be aware of, because every other command, it tries to add this as well. So invoke command, for example, he would try to invoke it. Would it cause an error? Raise your hand if you think it would cause an error then. No, because if it's like in the split. If you don't have the parameter for your command, it don't edit this to this. But if you have some, uh, did, you fu did a function on your own, you have written it, and it's called invoke, blah, 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 and it has a header parameter, then probably things go south. Yeah? Um, where I make use of it all of the time in my profile, for example, just as a good example, maybe you want to take it with you or not, I use it with the install module and the scoping uh, for the, let's say the scope is the current user and I load Clubber and even export CSV no type information because we all one point had the situation in PowerShell 5.1 where we just exported a CSV and there we got this little line which type I exported to my CSV before the whole content of the CSV files comes in and yeah. With no type information, you can get rid of it. But, and so I don't have to care anymore. It feels now PowerShell 5.1 really like PowerShell 7, just, okay, just for this command. So let's go ahead. Anything new for somebody? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait a second. I'm, I'm not sure about this 100%ly. Mm, usually I could, no, I, I think I could assign a, a Fred, maybe you could help me out for a second. Yeah, I can repeat the question, of course. I was asked if this only is applicable for punch, uh, function advanced functions. Okay, there was, there was there, Corey said, okay, we could use it also for executables. I don't know this right now, but like I have said, I will take a quick note and I will get through, I'll get through. I will add it if I have the solution for this and then just get it from GitHub, okay? So then, now we do some performance testing, but I guess we are already here for the performance parts. File reading. Reading a whole file from line one till the end. Which methods do you usually uh, use? Shout at me, maybe you heard something that I'm not using. Get content, perfect, amazing. Something else? Read all text from the uh, from system.file. Your Allen code? Oh, nice. That I didn't have on my screen, so thank you. Stream reader, perfect. That was I want to hear. I know some guys know, or some people here already know, which um, which techniques uh, I will now show because. Maybe you have he heard or not of the switch. That switch has a file parameter. I'm able, I have some, oh, yeah, that makes clicks. Okay, perfect. Switch has a file parameter. In the parentheses, I can just paste the plain file, uh, the, 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 the plain file, sorry, the path of the file. And in the default section right here, it will iterate through all of the lines and I will do an assignment in front of the switch statement, then it will just push all of the lines to my variable, and I've read the whole file from line one till the end. So the, re the question is now, what is faster? Because we're talking about performance here. Mm, the thing is, I would really love to um, make this run right now, but some of the examples take quite amount of time. Um, I will just show you how Huge, my huge file list is that I have prepared here is also in the repository. 
So it's 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 kind of large, yeah. I tend to say. So you get the idea why I'm not doing right now the whole performance tests on my own. If you haven't you heard of the measure PSM command, um, after this talk, go to head to Fred, have a talk with him. It's, it's in his PSM development module. Yeah. And he will probably talk with you about it for, if you say, please stop. So, <laughs> so it's really nice because then I can define my tests here with just a simple hash, uh, hash table. I just give it a name, and then I do the execution inside of the curly brackets, and then we get hopefully some results, like they look like this. Nice. So it's really structured. I see, okay, who's the winner, who's the fastest, and fight loss, in this case, is the fastest for my tests. I also did this. Uh, I didn't expect the other one. Why, why nobody tell me? Um, like we already see uh, or heard, get content, I define the path. I can make use of system.io.file, read all lines, and put also in the parentheses the path to read all of the lines. I can make use of the stream reader class, where I just can pass an argument for my, for my uh, just pass an argument for my path, and then I just iterate through in a while loop. They say, uh, okay, I make use of the more, um, method read line, and then it reads, Till, uh, till the end and assign it to this line and I just have to um, put out this line and then it will be also assigned to my variable. Okay, now, like, we, like I already showed, I spoiled myself a little bit. The file class was the, uh, file, well, why is it class? Um, yeah, but it was, was the file class. Okay, that's the reason. Um, <laughs> I thought it was switch was the winner but um, there are minor differences. And for example, get content is quite slow compared to all the other methods. So stream reader gets the third place, which is um, also doing fast compared to get content, but the other ones are even more faster and we looking for pace here, so. Okay, now. I, try, I have here, here, I had only iterated once through. So I said, okay, maybe for the two winning, um, winning methods, who is really fastest? Because the difference was not much. So I said, okay, do the iter iterate 15 times through to get a real feeling what could be uh, faster at the end. And let me go to results. And it's still the file class. Perfect. Okay, then I think we should all make use of the file class if we wanna read really fast through a, through a whole file and put it into a variable. But the thing is, what if we just won't have a specific line in our file? We read through. At some point, we hit our line that we are looking for and we wanna break the whole iteration because it's not needed and we found already what we are looking for. So then I have a problem with my file class because it reads all line. So in this case, I make use of the switch uh, statement and also make use of the um, stream reader uh, class because here in the sections, I can make a simple if statement and break, the f a break whenever I encounter or hit my a position where the line is that I'm looking for. Okay, let's let's see how I do this five times. Uh, pop, 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 pop. So I have my huge list of random objects. I because I just look into the thing, um, and here. I, just to get a random, uh, that was the reason, I just had to find one random line which is really at the end of the, um, of the file just that they have to run through. Um, so, then I said, okay, for the default statement, I put up a if statement, like the random line, I push it to my search variable, and I break the whole thing because I found already what I'm looking for but I can also do this in a case. 
because then when I just put it in a case, I don't have to use the default anymore and make an if statement. Yeah, it's pretty neat because I don't have to define. It's already there. Why not make use of it? And for the stream reader, I did the same thing in the while loop. If I encounter this specific line, just break and push it through our search variable. So just a little quiz. What is, what is the fastest? What are you thinking? The switch case, switch, or stream reader? Just shout. Okay, mixed, mixed feelings here. Okay, then let's get to the results. It's a default state. I don't know why it's the fastest, but it is the fastest. And it's, yeah, more or less, yeah. So even the stream reader is fastest instead of doing this with the case. So it was a big finding for me. Because once I look, at, look through Google through search like thingy and said, okay, I need something to read a fast real, uh, file real fast, and I just hit up the race you are, we already were aware of, stream reader and system IO, okay, and I go to Stack Overflow, and there was just a sub command saying, hey, have you ever used the switch uh, switch command because it is really fast. And it doesn't get many upvotes, but I thought, okay, let's do it. And it turns out to be really great in this kind of situation where I just need to find a specific line in a large file. So let us go to try catch some basic error handling. We all have done this, hopefully. If not, you will learn something really good now. <laughs> Back in the old days, I encountered it online Often, when I uh, searched for specific things, you can make use. Job also presented it to hopefully all of you. It was a really good session uh, on Monday. Um, there is the dollar, very, uh, dollar question mark variable. You all aware of this? No. Okay. Thank you. Then let me explain it to you all. Um, the thing is, if my last command run uh, did succeed, this um, variable becomes true. So, which means I can make use of it now as if this last command was successful. Why? It exists for this kind of the path that does not exist. Maybe it exists, so yeah, it would say, yeah, we did a good job. Otherwise, no, it does not exist at all. It's short, it's quite handy, but it's not real error handling. Yeah? So, we could then use a try catch instead. With get child item, like the path that does not exist. So what would happen? The path, the path that really not exists, I can show it to you. If I'm smart enough to make this for a second a little bit larger terminal, it does not exist. Why? What would you be expect what will happen now if I run the whole try catch? It run, it exists, yeah. Let's let's take a look if it's right. What the audience was shouting at me. It exists, but there's an error message. I would expect that I would go to the catch block and see, do it doesn't exist. But it, do, it does not. It does say it exists, even if we know it does not. Have anybody here idea why is this the case? Not terminating error, maybe. And here's here's some kind of reach, nothing to hide here, really. I trust myself. Is it, is it because your path statement is uh, not in quotes? Nope. It's basically my error action preference are set to continue. So I don't know if my user, what error action preferences my user has. I don't want to change them because it's his machine. Who I am to change this for him? So we have to find another way. But before we find another way to go really into the catch block, let me introduce you to finally. Who have heard of you heard of finally? Many hands, perfect. So at the end, I have a really good example how to make use of it. Um, little spoiler on the side. So like again, get child item, 
write it exist, do it doesn't exist, and finally, I'm done. So, we will encounter the same error. We will not go to the catch block at all, but let's see what's happened when we now execute this in our terminal. It exists, and it writes to me, I'm done. Okay, perfect. So, it just went through the try, and even when it succeeds, it goes to the finally block and yells something at me because I told it to do so. <laughs> Let's get fixed with the, that we are not uh, reaching the catch block. I just can't make simple use of the error action and say, stop. Every time I have an error, please, please stop. So I don't change the pr uh, preferences of the user. I just tell the command, if I ever encounter an error, stop, please, immediately. So let's test this out. But we will head to the catch block. And we have a return statement in our catch block. But we also have a write host here that says, I'm done. Shouldn't we, should it not stop by the return statement? Not at all. Because it's somewhat of, I like to say, cute. It's cute in this way, as it does the, uh, how to describe it pretty well, um, or even so that I'm able to tell you. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I run through the whole section here, I go to the catch block, but the determining error, uh, the uh, determining statement, in this case the return, wait until the final block has run through, and afterwards we go to the return statement and we are done with our function or our script, whatever. And that's the whole thing, we have to be aware of, but we can make real good use of it. We will see it shortly. But before this, we also, because may you have noticed, the error message is gone. We know there is an error, but which error we had? Because there are sometimes more or less beautiful messages that tell what we have done wrong and we could, how to, we could improve on this. We don't see it anymore. We have to bring it back. In the catch block itself, we can make use of the iteration marker or PS item to just get an instance of the last error. So when we have errors, we can make use of the error variable, which is basically an array of all of our errors that we have currently in our session. And the last error uh, is always the um, index pointer zero. So it's always, always a representation of that um, error index. So we can make use of PS item or PS underscore, uh, uh, PS item or dollar underscore. And then we can say, okay, exception, dot message. And we will get the message that the user would have seen, um, where's it read? Here, you cannot find path because it doesn't exist. Maybe you believe me, maybe you're not. Uh, we can run here straight, straight through. And yes, finally, nothing read anymore, but yeah, we are still in an error, so probably it would be a good idea to set some kind of uh, color here or make use of threads. Um, how, how the command is exactly called because I'm Hacking now, <laughs> myself. <laughs> right, PSF uh, message. Yeah. So also, after the session, if you don't want to hang around with me asking questions or giving feedback, you can also head to Fred. So now you have a job after the session. Um, yeah, like I said, and we never encounter this line underneath the finally block, catch me if you can, we can't catch it. So it's pretty good at running away because we are terminating uh, or ending our execution with the return statement. So, but we can also make another use of try catch. We can specify the error classifications and stick it to our catch block, which means if I have a command like here, dividing by zero, that is not an error for item not found exception. 
Then I can say, okay, basically if an error counter set is not aware of, I just put it like the default statement in a switch in a plain catch block and I will catch it and I do something more useful than I do instead of saying there was an error. Um, I can handle this. And let's figure out how this will look like. Come on. So, thank you. There was an error. I'm done. Perfectly. Now let's switch from dividing by zero to get child item. Again. Ooh, it does not exist. Yeah, it does not exist. So perfect. We are good to go. But how do I find such information like that is item not found exception in system management automation? Yeah, sure, I'm brilliant. I know this all from my own. No, I don't. Um, I just make a quick search because I can make use of the error itself. I can say go to exception, then I get a type and I get a full name. So when I ever build up a script and I counter by testing some errors, I just do this and could make my try catch really useful instead of all put to the catch and don't know which error I'm really Encounter, uh, encounter. So, I've promised you I have a really good real world example. Temporary files. Who makes use of temporary files? Yeah, raising some hands, good thing. Um, when I do the command new temporary file, I will get a temporary file. Thanks, PowerShell, you're so verbose. Um, now, when I do something inside of my try block, I create a new temporary file, I throw an error, I got to the catch statement, I shout at the user there was an error, I return, um, the temporary file is still existing. Maybe we should delete this so we don't waste any space on the hard drive anymore. And then I just can send the final block, temp file, remove item, and the system is clean again. For me, this is a really good example uh, uh, and a really good use case I make use of all the time. Who had something was now new to him or to her? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now let's talk about validate sets. We had uh, a session at Yab. He was also talking about validate sets and I shouted at him, because some uh, shout, nah, I say it because someone in the room was asking a question. I tried to not shout at other people then except of the speaker. Um, he was asking something about the validate set, and I said, uh, You can think of a DAO bouncer. He says, If something will let you in or not. And this goes for all parameters. And as we had yesterday, race code Wednesday, I thought this cat really needs a good vest. <laughs> and you have missed this out this year, next year, make sure you bring your rest. So, okay, that's something for the room, not for the record. <laughs> okay, with the validate set, I can specify some values that I'm allowed to push to my um, function uh, as a parameter. Like here, A, B, and C. What would happen if I run this command for my function test validate set test D? What? I have uh, an error. Okay, perfect. And yeah, I, I get an error. It's clear. It says the D does not belong to the set of A, B, and C. Perfect. But did you know I can assign a default value that is not in the validate set. Some people making like this, perfect. Some people looking at me like, what is he saying? Okay, that's also fine, but please stick with me. Um, yeah, the thing is, I'm the owner or the master of my function. I can assign inside of my function to it whatever I like. So that means also I can break my own things. And I'm good at breaking my own things. I don't want to break my own things. So I have to find another thing for this, for me. So now this is also some kind of, you don't have to do this, what I'm saying now, I just say why I think it's good 
You are free to take with you whatever you like, except of my notebook, me, or my travel buddy. <laughs> so, I could define an enum. Any, uh, anybody does not know what an enum is? Okay, with the enum I can, for example, in the .NET language we have several enums that we can make use of, for example, system.dayofweek, and we can iterate through or get the names of, these, of this enum by saying enum, and then use the function or the method, get names, and we see what is inside of this enum. It's just, in this case, a collection of strings, basically. Yeah? And um, like in this case, we know now, okay, it's double Sunday, and we go till Saturday for this, for this enum. So, let's make use of it, because we also can assign it as a param uh, for our parameter as a type. This enum. With tet, a test value that's set with enum, and I just do this. So, what will happen with my first command? I hopefully spelled Wednesday right. Yes! What will happen? It will just return Wednesday because I tell to do so. What happens when I say, okay, West Code Wednesday? Because it's not in this, it's in this enum. At first, it gives me an error. And then it says, okay, you're, um, what you try to pass isn't valid, but try something of this down below here, which is quite useful for my understanding. So, that's a good thing, but we, are we able to still break our own things? I, do a, I define here a custom enum with A, B, and C, just basic strings, so, um, and I can assign it as a, for the, as a type for my parameter, and I can also here assign a default a value, what will happen? It breaks, it stops immediately. So I make myself a little bit more secure about myself in writing terms of writing PowerShell functions because this thing is now good covered and it still works with all of the other, uh, sorry, I I had to run another function. Wait a second. Did, did I really didn't add up? I'm sorry. Ah, unable to find type. Uh, what? Wait. Da, ah, thank you. <laughs> You're such a lovely and nice crowd. Thank you. <laughs> so, one more time. Hopefully now. Ah, okay. Perfect. It tells me basically the same. I can't use run my own function anymore without any parameter because I was stupid and said, hey, let's go by D. But with a correct value, it probably and it does work good out. So hopefully there's some, some kind of takeaway with you. Now it gets a little bit more fancy, writing some classes. I know we all love .NET. That's the reason why we stick so heavily on PowerShell and the commands. But, but, but to, let me get it straight. We can really make a good use of it because there's uh, a class, I validate set values generator. Easy to say, easy to write, easy to remember. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so, then I define here a class regex expression. This is just an example. So if you are not familiar with regex, shame on you, but shame also on me because I know AI engines who could do this for me or I go to Matthias. So, um, <laughs> so then I define a hash table with some patterns, key value, like before. I have email and then I have the value for the easy to read, easy to understand, long regex expression and assign it to it. Then inside of this class, I can make use of the method get valid values. And what this simply does is it pushes valid values to my parameter, which is amazing because then I just push the keys as 
value similar parameter, in this case, email, phone, URL, and IP, like before, A, B, and C. In this case, we have a D, okay? So, then I can go to my function and say, hey, validate set. This is my class. I can define a custom error message. I can make look whatever it's like. I can make it look. I can make it really useful. And then I just go inside of my function, use whatever I provided outside of the function when I called it as a key to the whole hash table, and get returned the URL. So, which means, let me scroll and put it into my cache, because we already had this issue once before here. Okay, so, which means basically if I run this function, wow, so should a URL look like to be valid, which is really good because then I have it somewhere and if I ever have to check, I just use my own function. Yes. Um, when I misspell, like uh, instead of URL, I say URI because I didn't have covered it yet. Then I get an error. It is slightly less than we had before with a long blob of text of error message filling up the whole screen. And we just see our little error message that we have self defined. So, okay, if you have spare time, we can go further, make it more fancy or esoteric or however you like to call it. But for now, let's go ahead. If you have some spare time, please, I try to remember, but if I don't, yell, shout at me, yell at me, do whatever you like, so we can see something. Let us talk about performance one more time. Where object? We all do this. Did you know, hopefully we all do this. Um, when we just ask for something. Did you know other methods instead of where dash object curly brace to ask for a thing of a, in a collection or array or something like that? <laughs> right there. Yeah. Dot where, so make, a, make use of for each. Also really good example, perfect. Let's see how many things I have covered in my session where dash object without the curly braces, the where object with the curly braces, dot where for each object and dot for each object. So with the dotting, I make use of the dot, met method, uh, dot net methods. So I just trimmed the huge list of random objects a bit. Um, did you know to write uh, large numbers a little bit smaller that you can make use of KB, GB, MB, <laughs> yeah, then you have many takeaways. Good thing. So, so it's just a representation of 200 kilobytes as a simple number. So, like I, la like I said, I'm lazy. I don't type. So, I use VS Code and I try to even there get things smaller. Okay, like, like just now explained. I can make use of where object without the curly braces. Because if I have an object behind it that does has properties, then I don't have to define for simple uh, condition check. Um, just say, okay, what's the property name? And then make my condition up with greater than 7,000 um, in, this, in this file. I can also do it usually with curly brace, dollar underscore, dot property, GT, 7000. And I can make use of dot where, where I also have to use the iteration marker. I can also say, okay, for each object, like we see in the other examples, I make such a simple if statement and return the thing at the end. Or I can um, make use of the dot for each method. So, in this case, do you think who would win? Who would win the race of performance? Dot where? Perfect. I have a good audience who already know this. Perfect. Yeah. Dot where is really compared to all of the other one was the fastest for a large set of data. Not this much, but um, it was really faster than 
the other ones. So yeah, maybe you should stick with it. It's up to you. Um, okay, we've got another example. Inside with our dot where, as it was the winner, I said, okay, but what's, uh, what's up when I have something like here, such a string with a white card in it, and I try to make use of it in my, inside of my condition with like, I can use the regex with a match, I can also use, for example, equal substring and say, okay, I know I only need the first 10 um, characters of my string. Then I can say, okay, go with the name property, make a substring for the first characters and compare it with equal, then I do, don't have to do a wildcard search. Or I could also, because a string is also inside, in basically an array of chars in some way, I can just, uh, did you know that you can just um, count up with dot dot in between two numbers? also down. Okay, perfect. So, and then say, okay, just for the name, give me the first nine characters and join them all together. Otherwise, there would be an array as well. So I have to join them. Um, and then I compare also with equals. So, who could be the winner? Regex? Okay, I do it five times, like you can see here for the iteration. Yeah, and it was like, there are not many differences, to be honest. I just, it was my, just for my own, what is the fastest inside of condition? So there is not many wide span of performance things. And like you can see the equals with, okay, let's uh, make use of the array and do a join. Of course, I do many things inside of it. Then basically to plain uh, compare to something, it is kind of what's slower, but I just want to know if, equals or like in any way is slower or faster. So yeah, that's the whole thing about it. Um, let me see if we should go there. Um, yeah, then I wanted to know what's here faster by going again to the name and saying like, I just have to check them. Yeah, we have plenty of time, perfect. Um, and I just wanted to know, okay, when I just have the whole string and no white card in it, what is somewhat faster? Is it the, uh, white card, the string white card, or is it just uh, like and the whole string without any white card, or if it's even equals? And I just want to know what, what was faster. Any guesses so far? Hmm? Okay. And it is equal because then they, he has not to compare it like uh, search for any wild card to make use of it inside of it. It's just plain. Is it this thing? Yes, perfectly. But as you can see, the difference here is not that much because equals and like, as we don't have a wild card in it, tends to be somewhat the same. Yeah, with a wild card in it, then. He just asked if it's maybe even longer, is it for the next line longer or the next line? So this is somewhat a little bit slower, but yeah. So just to have made a proof, we are good to go for the next uh, technique topic, which is parameter set names. Anybody here uses parameter set names for their functions? Yeah, thanks for raising your hands, paying attention, yes. Um, I don't want to explain what is, what, well, maybe we could make a little bit more, yeah, so now it becomes cool. Um, I don't want to explain really what our parameter sets are. I will do a briefly introduction to this, but what I really want to say, I found a way how to smuggle data inside of my functions and make use of the parameter set names. So this is not right now best practice, it's just the idea how to treat things inside of PowerShell, okay? So I have a task. 
I have to write a simple function that calls various endpoints like device, user root for a, a fantastic imaginary API. It could be also a real API, but in this case, yeah, it's all pseudo. Um, I have a root, for example, that's always look like device, then ID, then info. User ID, info for the basic root. So let me show this. What I would come up with. Usually when I do, I could do a validate set. I can go to my endpoint. I say, okay, it's device or user. Then I have the type. I have the ID and I have the info. So I call the endpoint. I'm good. The user just has to say, okay, I go for the type with device. Okay, perfect. We are probably fine. We can do this. There's no shame. That's just simple usage. Perfect. We can make also switch statement out of it. We can assign it to a meter set name, so we aren't allowed to um, use both, and the user don't have to type type as a parameter, and then what was it? Control space, ah, I have user and devices because I could have many more. I just can say, okay, dash, and iterate through tab, which possibilities I have here. And so I have also the name, and that's the reason for a parameter set. You can just make use of one of it at a time. So I can make use of it as well here. And then I can make use of the parameter set name because this in this situation is currently our route. As I said, it's user slash ID slash info. So this ps command let com uh, variable dot parameter set name, I really directly get this. We can make a quick example if you don't, in case you don't believe me. Because, uh, like I said, I, I, I don't trust myself. So why you do? You do? <laughs> ID, one, two, three, four. And then can say, okay, yeah, because it's a once one, I have all the others, but I can make use of user. And here we go. We're going to the root of the user with ID 1234 to the info endpoint and get hopefully some useful information from our imaginary uh, graph uh, our API. <coughs> API, not graph API. So, okay, perfect. We can make use of it like this way. But what's about this one? Why not put the whole path into our parameter set name? Why we only have to use it for a user or device? Because then, like here, we have a combining of both are the same right here. We have the whole path stick to the parameter set name. And we could make use a switch for the user, for example, or the device. And just replace in the curly braces, I can define an index starting by null. And so I can say, okay, format this string, please, in some way. And the first thing occurs, which is in curly brace and contains a number, just replaces with my ID. So I don't have to uh, really make things for my own and replace it inside, uh, make it structured like we had before, like here, where I have to fill in separate, uh, many variables instead of one string, instead I just can inject this with the format. Now it operates like the same, get endpoint info, and it does exactly the same thing, but why it is, this could be more useful than my previous example, maybe an idea? Someone? Just shout. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Does the um, parameter ID have to be uh, in an order index zero? No. They don't have to be. Uh, the question was, does the ID parameter have to be in order with the index zero, for example, or position zero, uh, to make any use of it? No. It could be stand everywhere like this, no, no matter at all. So I just go by taking it in the first place. So. Um, the thing is, why this is then 
more useful than my previous example is, what if the roots are somewhat different? Like here, I have device location ID info. I have user, all user ID info. If, if my endpoints uh, has much of variation into the roots, I just could define it like here. But we could also define it outside of our function, maybe in a file, and make just a hash table or CSV or something like that. In this case, I stick with the uh, hash table. So I said, okay, for the user, I have this route for the device, I've got this one. So simply, we already know this, basic thing. Now, I have params, section of my params section, just with the ID, and then I make use of the dynamic parameter, because also in my session abstract you saw there is something about dynamic parameters, and now is the part we're talking about dynamic parameters. They are so easy to use, there's not much text for it. No. <laughs> Do I have to look it up from a previous example of mine all the time, I'll just go online and search for to write it? Yes, I do, but it can become handy, even if I don't have get help for it. So that's a major, oh. but if you have a large um, function and you want to have many, many, many parameters on it, because we do a, uh, yeah, uh, an undefined get endpoint info, so we define what we want to have from the endpoint, it could become quite handy. So I, I won't explain into detail. I just say, okay, we need a parameter directory, a dictionary, sorry. And then I go through all of my roots by iterating via get enumerator of my hash table. I have my name, I use my dot for each method. Then I say, okay, here's a parameter attribute. And then I send parameter set name by looking for each key that I have and say the name of my parameter is the value of my hash table. So like we have seen it here before, I just want to recreate what we have already here above. And that's the major thing about this. Um, and I say it's mandatory. And then I need to define attribute collection and add this parameter attribute to this collection. Then I define my runt time defined parameter with just the name of the key. What kind of type is it? In this case, it's a switch. And then I uh, added the attribute collection. And for my parameter dictionary, I just add what I have archived so far in this construct how to dynamic parameters basically work. And afterwards, I return just the parameter, uh, the dictionary and then, like we can run it if you want for another time, because it's also the last example. And I make sure I highlight all of the things I need for this. So, like again, get endpoint info. Uh, I just should. And just basically works the same. Like I said, this becomes handy when I have a bunch of different routes that I need to assign in any way then it becomes really handy in my point of view. So this was some kind of what are parameter, what are parameter set names and how I could make use of it. A little bit unusual, I like to say. Anything who's uh, here in the room who says, uh, anyone here in the room who says that was brilliant or this was a good idea or this was totally why you do this. <laughs> Just shout at me. I think it's clever, but I don't know anyone that would be able to read it very well. I think of it inside of uh, auto-generating. Um, if my endpoint, uh, just the people in my company who would develop an endpoint and give it to me, just the routes, and I don't have want to uh, redo my function all the time, I just use this because I don't have to care anymore. Right. And then it's basically fine. 
in this case, I, when I have just an idea and have to put it, because it could become a little bit more complicated easily, but for such a simple scenario, that would, would work out pretty well. And so I can also make use of it in the side, inside. I like to use dynamic parameters when it's inside of a private function of my module. Because, like I said, there is no get help. I can't add a uh, help uh, synopsis for these parameters. So usually I don't want to ship it to users. Yeah? But inside of my function, inside of my module, I'm completely free for this. Yeah? So, okay. Who has heard of update type data? This command. Few hands. Perfect. So, we can extend type data. What does this mean? For example, uh, when I do a file server migration and the customer says to me, we want to get rid of all those old files because they are laying on tapes in our cellar. I don't need it anyhow anymore. I just have to keep it there. But on my file server in the cloud, I don't want to waste such much space, get rid of the old files when you do the migration into the cloud or to another place. Doesn't matter. Um, then he asked me, okay, all the files which are older than 10 years, get rid of it. So then what I could do, I could say, okay, for get child item path, <coughs> ctemp, I get all of the files. Maybe recursive would be also a good idea here, but it's just an example. Um, and say, so, okay, where object, the last write time is less than our current day plus minus five days. So I, in this case, it's just five days, not 10 years, but just to get a basic idea behind it, okay? So, any questions so far? Okay, perfect. When it, if it doesn't look that and you raise your hand and I don't see it, shout, yeah? Just do it. Um, what I can make, I can make a function out of it and assign it to a variable. So I just have a parameters section. I say, okay, that's the days. I get the current date, just to look a little bit, look more beautiful than I did it here in the where object section. Then I get older than, and who knows what happens here, because this is relying on PowerShell 7.x and not PowerShell 5.1, uh, 5.1 currently. There's a ternary operator, correct. Thanks for this input. It's basically if my uh, last write time is less than older than, if this is the case, marked by the question, uh, by the question sign, uh, by the question mark, yeah. Uh, then we say, okay, it's true. Otherwise, by the column, we say it's false. So, now we come to the fun part. We have here an extent, <coughs> I, I just make the a hash table of it. And um, I say, okay, there's a type name where we want to apply our new type that we are currently creating to systemio.fileinfo because we have files and we want to add this. So we have a member type. We can use make it a script method. Just let me take, because I oh. talking through one hour, just need to refresh. Okay. So then we say the member type is a script method, which means it can execute it when it gets called and the object is will be created. So it's not that way of static beforehand. Yeah? So then I say, how should I call this in anyhow? I can call it then by older than. Yeah? And then I have a value and then just assign my little script that I've prepared here and put it to the variable extent method older than. And then I basically say, okay, update type data. So how does it look like? Mm. Until here, okay. Now when I say get, <coughs> sorry, um, probably I prepared something here. Yeah, it is. Good question. Um, <laughs> so I get, all of the files of my ctemp drive in the main or the first um, entry level of folder hierarchy. And now I can say file dot older than because we have defined it. In the parentheses, 
I just put the amount how many back times back I will go. And now you will see for a short time how messy my C temp currently is, because that's the thing. Ha, huh, good thing. It just tells me, okay, there are files that are older than 50, and there are files that are kind of a bit younger. So, by saying true and false, now I know that's the fact that I have some files that are basically all in 50 days, but what files, which files are them? Simple, I can use it in a rare object. I can say, okay, iterate through, make use of the um, older than 50, and now I only get those files which are older than 50 days old because the return is just a basic true or false. And then I could put it into a rare object while iterating through all of my files. And yeah, like you can see, I, I'm a messy guy. And oh, thank you. Okay, so get CLS doesn't work. Now we know. <laughs> so, okay, now just hide it because, yeah. Okay, what we can do also instead of a script method, we can make something more static. We can make use of a script property instead. The same function right here, but now we have no parameter anymore. I just defined five. For example, a customer says to me, Christian, please get rid of all files that are older than 10 years. I just make it here in this case uh, static and define it there and give it a proper name like older than five because in this case I asked for files that are older than five. Um, instead of 10 years, and like this, as is a property, I just can also go by where object without the curly braces. Now, a little example where that comes in handy because all the amazing .NET and C Sharp developers have so many cool methods because when they have a collection, they can make use of a function that's called get value or default. Yeah? So imagine you have a hash table. You ask the hash table for a key that does not exist. What happens? What happens? You get an error, correct. So the thing is with C -sharp or .net, with this method, I just can define what I should assign if I don't find any value while having a key. And if I want to do this in PowerShell, I could do the bad way and use, in this case, my example is just, I have a number and I have a, correlated, a correlating language, just give me the language for my number. So in this case, um, one is German, two French, and so on, I could make use of if, else, else, if, Else if, else if, else if, else if, if, else. Okay? And then we say, okay, if doesn't any number match, then it's English. Another way what could be used here? Switch statement. Perfect. It's not only good for fights. It's the ugly way because I called it that way the good, the bad, and ugly, thanks to Chris Dent, um, because he did a session. Uh, also, does the nearly same way I have my own style, but yeah, I'm a little bit of a copycat. Um, as we had from cats, um, I can make use of a switch statement. I say, okay, to, uh, define here one, two, three, four, five, and just assign it by default. I give English back. And now we can come to the good part. Or we'll skip to the good part. Um, I can make the same function like we all the C Sharp and .NET developers already have. Get value or default, where I just say, if my um, hash set contains a key, return the value of the key. If not, return a default value. So, like the same way before, we define our split, we make use of the script method, we update our type data for system collections.hash table. Now we have our number. We have our, our language table. Like before, no English. And then I just can say language table, get value or default. In the parentheses, I give it a number. And if it 
don't find this, please use English. Because now I have to define this one first and can make use of it all the time. And I think this was a pretty neat discovery for me because I make use of it. What are your thoughts about it? Thank you. So, 15 minutes to go. Perfect. I'm so lucky that I filled my bag with so many topics to show you. Performance again. Get max value. We have a large array of numbers. Or, for example, it must, be, must, must not be large. Could be also somewhat smaller, like 1, 7, 15, 9, 3, 2. How you would get the maximum number out of it. Just shout, be awake. Measure object maximum as a parameter and then get the maximum property. Another cool way, yeah. sort object is also good because then you can say sort object, the scanning, select first, and then you get this, okay? I also aware of those both, but I uh, did some, um, I did some, <coughs> sorry, I did some code golfing and was testing around because I needed to get the maximum number out of something. And I was like, hmm, there's, mathem there's a mathematical approach which I can utilize to do this. Because if I just ask, uh, imagine a whole, a whole array of numbers, I iterate once through and say, okay, uh, at the start I say the first number in my array is the largest or the highest number. So, then I say, I ask if the next number is larger than the first one, or higher than the first one, then assign it to the largest number. And just go through once, and then at the end, I have assigned the largest number or the highest number to my variable. That's what would be the mathematical approach here. Yeah? So, um, for this test, because um, James Brundage did the bench press module, I don't say that I think this or that is better. Both exist. I just want to mention both of them because I like James, I also like uh, Fred. So it, but it does basically the same thing like Fred's measure command in some ways. Maybe they can compete and say what, which is better, but uh, yeah, no, not, not right now. Uh, who I am to judge. And I made use of the mathematical approach by using the math class and go by the max property. By the max property, uh, max method, you get as a return the highest of both numbers. You can only do two numbers. You can't have a large array, but then I don't have to do if, huh, then, yeah. So I just stick with that. Um, we have, like we said, sort object and t take the, la uh, the first, uh, the last item over it. So I just try to avoid to make it also the scanning to make it a little bit, more, bit, little bit more fast. And we can make use of measure object maximum. Uh, did you know when you say in an index minus one, you get to the last element of the array? Perfect. Okay. Um, then I defined some data for it. Some kind of large data. So my numbers are in between of 0 and 1 GB, which translate to this beautiful, amazing long number. And then with PowerShell 7.1, we have also forget random the dot uh, the count parameter. And I can say how often I need a random object inside of this scope, which is quite hand, uh, handy if you ask me. So I have a really large uh, array a large array, medium, small, and tiny, with just 100 items in it, numbers in it. Okay. So let's analyze it. This was, like I said here, this was what I tried to explain, probably I've shown you, but it is in the code, so take use of it if you like to. Um, here I did it with the scanning. So, and here's the mathematical approach. Perfect. Now we come to the tests. The math, the sort, and the measure. I do this five times for the medium size. Who would be the winner? 
math. Okay. Not my favorite subject in school, but in this case, yeah, it's compared to the other really fast. Sort is really, really slow doing this. You can do this, but if you can do something, it doesn't mean you have to be always aware of that. So, what's about our small size? Our small size, as a short remember, where up to this number. What do you think what happens when the list becomes really shorter than the example before? Any guesses? Same? Okay, I hear the same. Yeah, totally. We should stick with math. For large size, still math. As we know, if little or less tiny and large math is the uh, best, probably for larger it would also be the best. But let us look how better this turns out if it increases in size compared to medium, compared to large. It is somewhat the same, I like to say. Now our tiny size, our only 100 items. Any guesses? Math. math? Because math is the solution, is the key to everything? Nope, it's measure. So, yeah, good takeaway. I just can't say one solution is a solution for all. I just always have to remember to test my things out if I really want to take advantage of performance. Then I have to test my data, I have to check my data, and then I can make tests and then see, okay, in which situation, what fits the most or the best. So, in this case, it was, like I said, not the math approach. And we have eight more minutes. Okay. Every time you have questions, just show them, okay? So, parameter set a parameter validation with JSON. Ever thought of this idea? Raise your hands. You have thought of it. Yeah, okay. Perfect, Fred. So, let's play some Powerball or Lotto called in Germany. So, so uh, basic uh, principle, we, have a we can make here use of a validate set, we make use of a JSON schema validation, and we make a performance test afterwards. So what does our function has to have? A name for the player, an age number that is between 18 and I don't want to say 99 years old because so what I would exclude some people and I don't know how the medical situation on this planet would evolve, so I go with int max value number for years. So, and I have numbers, I have an array. It must contain six numbers as we're playing uh, Powerball and they have to be between one and 69. Haha. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> okay, now, now let's keep on. Okay, so how would the function look like? We have our string. It must contain something, so it's valid, not null or empty. We have to have our age, which is between 18 and the max number of int. Of int. Maybe I could show it for a second. So we have a max number value for integers. If you go above, go with int 64 or big integer or whatever you like. But in this case, there's probably enough. <laughs> um, and then we have our numbers. We have a validate count from six to six, so we need six. And we have a validate range from one to 69. No laughing at this point anymore. Um, and then I could make use of schema JSON schema validation. And there will be today a good talk by James, who just have a talk directly about this. Um, no, it wasn't, no, no, they, they, no, I'm sorry. Oh? I have to find a schedule, but there was a good, is or was a good talk about this. So, okay. So we have JSON, um, we can just define a JSON schema hash table. I always have to look it up or let's generate it for myself. 
to be honest, but I could define the same things like I already did before. I can say I have properties like the name, it's of type string, I have the age with an integer, I have a minimum of 18, maximum here is always the max, uh, maximum of the integer itself, so I don't have to define it, but it's good, but uh, compared to the size, the other one is a kind of bit smaller, so quite for, uh, quietly more useful. Um, then I have my numbers, I have a type of an array, I say what's the minimum, maximum, what's the minimum number of items, what's the maximum number of items, six and six, so we get six, and I can say what's mandatory by saying what's required, the name, the age, and the numbers. And then, now comes the fun part, I take my PS bound parameters that I've defined above, name, age, numbers, without any validation. I say, convert please, please this to me to JSON. The depth of six is not required here because we don't go so deep into this JSON mode, does we? Probably we does, that's the reason why I put it there. Um, test JSON, and then we can pipe it to test JSON and say, please test our JSON against the schema, if it's valid, like here, and then can say, okay, this is my hash table, convert this also to JSON, and test it please for me. And then you get probably any kind of feedback or not, let's see. Okay, for this, let us straight have pace up a little bit because we may be running out of time in a few minutes. So, just put it like this. I did, okay, perfect. So, read and use it. I define the split because we already know split is key, or at least split is good to use in some situations, so I make use of it. I have a working split, which will fill the all the requirements, and I have one that's failing because 67.7 is way above 69. Okay, let's test our two splats against the whole thing, or the whole functions that we have created before, or saw before. Just start by a new Powerball validate set, so without a schema, a uh, JSON schema thing. Works. Complaints that the number 677, no, you are not allowed to do so. Um, now we do the same for the JSON schema, works fine. We get a slightly different error message from our schema template, but we also able to see this any way. Yeah? So it's fine, it's JSON, it's okay. But the thing is, before we start, they taking a performance tour, or we have to skip it for now, because time runs out. What is if I have multiple made mistakes in my split? Like I said, I said 677, and only five numbers. What would happen by just the validate set? How would the error occur to me? Just the first one, the first one that appears. That's correct. Let's make a first quick test. Just get rid of the five and uh, the six ones. It was the five, so yeah. Okay, you get the point. And now we do the bad thing for our validate set test. Yep, it's only complaining that six seven seven isn't is too high, but not that the amount is slightly um, less than we need to expect instead of these six. So let us do this once again with the schema validation. We get two error messages. So when I think of debugging a thing, and I just want to know, okay, what would be an error for which situation, then I get shouted at once with all of the errors instead of, um, yeah, instead of trying again, trying again, trying it again. This could make useful. It's a pain to write. There are useful tools that help me for this, AI. <laughs> and 
Any, anybody has some bullshit bingo? Okay, no? Good, thank you. Um, so that's the reason why I say, okay, this is quite useful. And, but let me say, because I can't demonstrate right now, the basic value they set is quite faster than compared to the JSON validation. Last note, with the JSON validation, you can also make use of it by piping objects into it, make it a JSON, define a schema, and then you have the possibility to create graph batch requests out of PS custom or hash table objects. I have an example for this. You can just head up to me and we can talk about it. But for now, all of the code, I'm a little overdoing. I just start right here from current slide. Performance tweaks, let's say connected. Means some people might want to scan a QR code if they really are into, let's talk with him, he seems to know a thing or two. Or you just go, go by link tree HC Ritter because that's my handle basically everywhere except of Twitter. So, one more time, thank you all for your patience for showing up this early, for how many here in the room, and for paying such a good attention and integrating with me. Thank you. <laughs>